Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the University of Surrey. My name's Graham Miller. Uh, I'll be your host this evening for this uh, in-person event. Uh, we are very excited to be allowed to have a beer uh, inside and not having to freeze outside uh, for our beer. So apologies if you think that anybody's uh, starting to look like they're getting uh, too excited uh, through the course of the evening with our newfound uh, freedoms. This evening's event is part of the Part of Science uh, programme. Part of Science is a worldwide festival which uh, brings researchers uh, out of their offices and labs uh, into local pubs, cafes, spaces uh, in order to be able to share their research with you. Uh, this year, for the first time, we are doing a, a, a virtual uh, event. Uh, the positives of that are that we have people joining us from all over the world. So uh, welcome to you from uh, wherever you are this evening. Um, we have, uh, we are doing so in a COVID compliant and safe way. The panelists have all been tested. Uh, we're not going to say what they've been tested for, <laughs> but um, I suspect HR might be in touch with a few of you about the results. Um, and we are all socially distanced. Uh, the format of this evening is that we're going, I'm going to shortly ask uh, all the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, I'm going to put a question to them and then we will go to a question and answer um, section of the evening. So please feel free to, uh, to write in your questions on the, the chat function. Those will come through to me and then I'll be able to put those um, to the panel. Um, as if that's not enough excitement, um, we are giving you the chance to win some fantastic prizes this evening. Uh, we're going to test your listening skills with our topical bingo. So in the chat function um, that you should be able to see, there's a link for you to access your unique bingo card, which will contain 16 words. Uh, when you hear me, but only me, uh, say any of those words on your card, then mark them off, uh, and a prize will be awarded to the first two players this evening to complete either a horizontal or a, ver a vertical, you know how bingo works, uh, line, uh, with a star prize available for the first player to complete an entire card uh, and shout full house. Uh, so when you've got your row or your, your full house type bingo into the chat function, email a copy of that card to events at surrey.ac.uk uh, and we'll let you know if you're one of our lucky winners. So uh, I am going to go to the panel, uh, ask them to introduce themselves. We'll go round. We'll start with Deborah. Introduction, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Deborah Dunn Walters, Professor of Immunology, and I'm the uh, research team lead for lifelong health at the University of Surrey. Fantastic. Uh, Amelia? I'm Professor Amelia Hadfield. I'm head of the Department of Politics and co director of the Centre for Britain and Europe and also Dean International. Richard? Hello, everyone. I'm Richard Murphy. I'm Professor of Life Cycle Assessment in Surrey's Centre for Environment and Sustainability. Very good. And uh, Vegeta? Um, uh, my name is Brigitte Gasseleber and I'm a professor of environmental psychology. And Caroline. Um, my name is Caroline Scarls and I'm a professor of technology and society and I am the centre lead for the Centre for Digital Transformation and the Visitor Economy. Very long title. It's a very long title. <laughs> <Yeah>. Fantastic. So uh, thank you to everybody. So we have a, a talented panel here this evening uh, representing a range of disciplines uh, from social sciences all the way to through to the other stuff. Um, <laughs> So uh, the question I'm going to kick off with, uh, I'm going to start with with Deborah, is what changes, uh, well, what changes would you like to see and what changes do you think we'll see um, as a result of the of the COVID pandemic in the way that we live our lives? So Deborah. 
So I think um, we've seen a lot of change over the last year. And some of it, I think we need to keep. There's obviously a lot of it that we don't want to keep. Um, one of the things in science in particular, the, the speed of generation of data and communication of that data across the globe has been absolutely awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and the cooperation between people. Um, so I would like to keep that. Um, I would also like to keep the cooperation between society, everybody in society. We can all point fingers at frontline workers and say thank you to them, but everybody in society has been involved in this fight and uh, have been supporting each other, and I would like to keep that as well. We've, we've all been uh, come very much aware of infection control. Normally, only if you work in a hospital do you know about infection control, right? But we all, you know, we're all sitting here with all the windows open, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and I would, I would hope that we wouldn't forget that because I'm sure mm. I'm not the only one who's been really pleased not to have a cold or flu mm. or anything for over a year now. And, and I think if we keep some of our behavioral changes as we go forward, then maybe our flu seasons won't be so bad either. Just by very simple changes that we've got used to, if we can keep those. There's a few lessons I think we've learned that I would like to see it might take a long time to go forward, but I, I just mentioned having windows open. Fresh air is really, really important. It's a lot harder to catch anything if you're outside mm. um, or if you're inside with good air changes. So maybe if into building regulations in the future, we could get things put in there which enable us to have fresh air without freezing to death. That would be quite nice. Um, so that's like a a, a, a kind of something I'd like to see happen in future. Um, and, and what I think has been quite sad is that we've had health inequalities in this country before the pandemic, and they've really been brought to the fore mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, a lot of the underlying conditions that have made people particularly susceptible are things that can be changed a bit by changes in lifestyle. And I think we need to work really hard at that in the future to try and get that sorted. Um, and I think probably the last thing I want to say, because I know we've only got a short time each, is um, I wouldn't be a professor of immunology without mentioning vaccination, right? And it's just so important. And the speed at which we've made new vaccines, I think was amazing. And I think the way that people have taken up vaccination in this country has been amazing. I would like to keep that going forward and um, ask people to get a vaccine to protect themselves, their families, the community, and to help other people get a vaccine, because some people can't drive a car to the vaccination place or whatever. Um, so I'll probably finish on that <coughs> message that I really <laughs> want people to keep ahead with the with the good stuff on the vaccines. Very good. Well, that's a nice public information message yes. for, yeah. for, for people out there. <laughs> Go get vaccinated. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what are you doing listening to this? Go <laughs> get vaccinated. <laughs> Uh, good. Uh, Amelia, before um, COVID kicked off, we thought the Brexit was the most important thing uh, yes, happening in the world. Did. And that's rather been supplanted. Mm. Um, from your perspective, Professor of Political Science, what do you? Uh, what are the things you, you want to keep and what do you think we will keep? Indeed. Um, well, I, I'd like to echo a little bit of what Deborah said to begin with um, about collaboration. So international supply chain, chains, amazing mm. development of science, I think at the multilateral level. So the communication between states, between organizations, mm. um, I think is incredibly important. A, a lot of the news hasn't been great because I think we, we've seen um, anger and I think we've seen frustration coming out of the World Health Organization, the European Union, etc. Um, some of these regions have not necessarily covered themselves in glory. Mm. And yet at the same time, they are responsible. Um, they are the, the wellsprings, if you like, for a huge amount of collaboration and innovation. So they, they have pushed things forward. What I'd like to see, I think, is enhanced political will to try to really um, grasp that innovation and codify it, you know, knock it into an international treaty um, and really try to ring fence the best of what we've seen. Um, I think at the, at the at the local level, however, and we've we've just had a, a series of local elections which have shown um, some some surprising results, I think, in some ways, and also confirmed you know pre-COVID patterns as well. Place-based growth seems to be something that's really bubbling up. We are enormously um, much more aware, I think, in a very concentrated way of where we come from. So the sense of active localism and active communities, um, whether that's trying to generate increased interest, you know, in 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 our in a county. Um, or looking at the way in which the high street has become uh, very, very different. I think there's a very real fear 
of a gap tooth high street now and mm -hmm. trying to think about ways in which to rework, repurpose spaces and places. Um, so I, I would like to see sort of uh, multi-purpose and multi-functionality um, as a trend, a community-based trend. This idea of collaboration is interesting, isn't it? Because we're going to, there's, there's any number of collaboration requirements in the future, whether it's on protecting the oceans, protecting climate, we've got COP26 this year, but we've got a very real need to collaborate right now, right in front of us. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a good test to see whether as nations we can collaborate in the ways that we have previously as nations during wars and emergencies, because we're gonna to need to set up those collaborative instruments to protect against those other big challenges coming in the future. Well, COVAX is a really nice example mm. of this, I think. So the idea of the, the European Union and the World Health Organization and about two dozen other signatories say, yes, I think we can. It balances out to some degree, some of the really rabid health inequalities we've seen pre-COVID. Mm. But the idea, of course, is to use and foster cooperation to try to spread it out. I, I'm not unoptimistic, but I, I, I do think they have a bit of a hill to climb. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Richard, same question. What do you think from your uh, disciplinary perspective? Yeah, as, as you might imagine, one of the things that we're really concerned with is climate change in, in the sustainability Centre for Sustainability and as theme lead for sustainability at the university. So one of our real concerns about the pandemic and uh, that's playing its course at the moment was that it would actually have a really negative effect on the moves towards um, climate action and sustainability. So we did a lot of work with the local community around here and we surveyed uh, particularly do, actually during the height of the pandemic, and found that um, sustainability and climate action had not been knocked off as people's number one mm. priority, even though there was the whole of the pandemic happening, I'm speaking locally in the UK. It, it was really amazing, and we were doing work with Heathrow Airport as well and things, and their response to this, because they had an extraordinary um, you know, change in their um, passenger numbers. And it, even there, it's still really high up. So building back better would seem to be something that will come through, but with climate action very, very high on the agenda. I'd, I'd certainly pick up on a couple of things that have been said here. What I'd like to see is um, much greater respect for nature and our ability to sort of store carbon and do the work that's going to require climate action with action on nature and biodiversity. It's so important. I think one of my memories of, of the early days of the pandemic was actually sitting you know, in a quiet green space and just being able to hear wildlife, mm. birds, much less sound around. And I think people have really picked up a much greater sense of the natural world and its importance. And so and I'm, you'd expect me to say, because I'm a biologist and a fungal and plant biologist by background, but I think it's really coming through. Um, just another little bit of localism, the Surrey um, work we did for the Surrey carbon emissions shows that our direct emissions are about 6 million tonnes of CO2 per annum in, in the county, but negative emissions are about a quarter of a million tonnes of CO2 by carbon storage on land. So it's one of the few abilities we've got to have carbon negative effects, and we're going to need them if we're going to combat climate change, even if we stopped using fossil fuels almost immediately. Indeed. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Um, Bagita, environmental psychology, what, uh, what are you expecting? So, well, I, what I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's very similar to some of the things that have already been said. So the environmental psychology is obviously I'm interested in studying people's relationship with the environment uh, and ideally promote sustainable lifestyles, which are characterized by both high well-being and uh, high sustainability. So one of the things, of course, we've seen during the pandemic is that we can, if we really want to, make massive changes mm. to our lifestyle mm. without it actually undermining our well-being uh, and actually benefiting the, the environment quite significantly. Suddenly, we all stopped flying. Suddenly, we all stopped driving. Uh, and like Richard was saying, we sit and we can suddenly hear the birds singing. The air quality improved. And so we know that we can improve our life and we can you know we can improve the environment in, in doing so so my yes yeah, so my 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 main uh, sort of thing that i would like to see really is changes in lifestyles and changes in lifestyles that are good for ourselves and in the environment we did a survey a serv um, on, on travel to work and one of the things for instance we found is that most people drive to work as you expect uh, and 70% of the people that we surveyed have never or very rarely worked at home before mm. the pandemic. 
we found that m all of them, obviously, worked at home during the pandemic, during the first lockdown, because they had to. Uh, and actually, most people said that they would really want to continue working at home. Most of the people, more than 70, 80 percent, said that uh, they felt that they could concentrate better, they could organize their life better, they could enjoy just enjoyed working at home. Obviously, some people hated it. We know that some people actually really, really hated it. Some people have very different home lives but, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the majority of people liked it. Uh, and I'm not saying that everybody should work at home all the time, of course, because it's really nice to see real people uh, every now and again that, and to know that we are still real and we're not actually avatars. But, um, but we can do a lot more. We can work at home a lot more. We can go outside into nature a lot more. And the, the one thing that we found is people didn't go on holiday, didn't fly to the other side of the world. They just stayed locally. And, and actually, a lot of people really enjoyed it. Lots of people said that they appreciated their local environment much more than they did before. They spent more time in their garden. They spent more time gardening. And we've done a lot of work that shows that engaging with nature is really good for your health and well-being. So again, we can do that more. And one of the other things we've, we've been working on a project to, to look at nature engagements during COVID and pre and during and post COVID and their people's well-being. I'm sure Caroline's going to say more about this. So I want to see the, steal that away. But one of the things that we found in uh, some, one of the studies that we did was that actual, actual active, more mindful engagement is particularly beneficial for people. So gardening, listening to wildlife, mm. and being aware of the natural world and the quality and the beauty of nature is more beneficial for your well-being and your quality of life. And it's also obviously good for the environment because it makes, makes people more, yeah, more careful for the environment. So that's what I would like to see, people being more careful, more mindful of the natural world in improving their own well-being in the process, because we know we can do it. We've shown and, and that we can do, do, it. do you think that, um, so as you say, we've seen these huge changes in the way that we live our life. Do you think this is going to make uh, your discipline, social sciences maybe in general, more ambitious for what we can do with behaviour change? Because this has been the most incredible social experiment. We could never have done this in labs. We could never have changed people and manipulated people mm. like this. And I wonder whether it does make us now think, there's greater potential for behavior change for people in addressing some of these other challenges that, that Richard and others have, have talked about. I hope so. I, was, I thought you were going to say redundant, made no. the discipline redundant. <laughs> right, right, now that we know we can do it. That's, that's my job done for. No, so, I don't agree no, with that. I, I need a crisis to keep. I've got a pension and mortgage to pay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, well, obviously, I, yes, I hope so. I think, it, I think we, have, we have seen that people can make all these changes, they can support. Uh, they, they are willing to support policies and quite extreme um, policies and decision making if they feel that there is a need for it. Mm. So I think, yeah, I think it, hopefully um, we will have seen that as social scientists, we, we, we have a lot to say about what people are willing to do, what people mm. can do and how that can improve their well-being and the environment. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, then, uh, last but not least, what um, what changes do you would you like to see and do you think will Come. Okay, well, that's the joy of going last. Lots of people yes, have already touched said. upon all of these things. But um, yeah, I mean, th there's several things from, from the perspective of the research that we've been doing. And, and Deborah, you started off by saying about the importance of community and, and how community really has been at the heart of so much that has happened over the course of the pandemic. And, and I think one of the things that's certainly come through in, in work that we've been doing is the importance of hyperlocality. You know, people, when, when we're traveling, when we're moving around the work that we've been doing together, but people are becoming more aware of what's on their doorstep. You know, so I'm in the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. Um, and actually the, the importance of tourism on your doorstep and understanding your local community and understanding actually that that's not always, when we travel, it's not always about where we go on holiday overseas, et cetera. It's about the contributions that we can make. And, and I would really like to see that to continue. So, you know, to in the vein of sustainability and climate change and maybe rethinking our, our travel behaviors, actually just doing more and appreciating more of what we have and the beauty of what we have. And, and you don't have to go to the other side of the world to get that really strong sense of wanderlust. Of course, we still would like to travel. I'm not saying for a moment, don't worry, that um, we shouldn't travel. But, but it's about really reappreciating what we have on our doorstep. Some of the other things that I would really like to see is just continuing to harness that innovation and creativity that we've seen. Some of the, the most wonderful examples of 
creative resilience have been the ways in which local businesses etc have been able to remain resilient throughout and be able to retain services throughout the pandemic you know one of the the research projects that we've been working on is really looking at how we can use things like augmented reality within the arts and heritage sector for example now we know in the in the, the lockdowns the doors have closed and people have not been able to go into the museums it was wonderful to see them open up again on on monday um, but as we see them reopening Again, it's about reflecting on the ways in which they've been able to adopt some of these technologies. We've been working with a company called Smartify um, to really understand the ways in which we can use augmented reality solutions to create virtual experiences for people. We see the kind of the Google um, art and culture. We see, you know, local tour guides have been opening up and doing live stream tours of Berlin or, you know, we've seen now Amazon Explore open up in the US as well. So all of this real kind of innovation and, and kind of just, just creativity and how we can adopt technologies in new and different ways. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that mm -hmm. and seeing how that develops. We've seen it in the events space as well throughout the entire cultural sector. And as the, the Arts Council have just released their Let's Create um, strategy um, just very recently. So again, really understanding and putting community at the heart of that as well. So as destinations, we can't, obviously, we're, we're getting the traffic light systems and everything are uh, beginning to see movement as well. The other thing that I would like to see, and it really ties back to Richard, what, what you were saying, is when we do start moving more, that we actually do that in a more, even more responsible way, that we do and we actually engage in what's called kind of regenerative or restorative tourism practices. So being sensitive to the destinations that we go to, taking time to understand them in ways maybe that we wouldn't have done before, but also for those destinations to, ha to have and take that opportunity to rebuild themselves in a way that is more sustainable. We see the classic kind of, you mentioned, Brigitte, about the pristine environments, being able to see birds. You know, you look at the canals of Venice that have been all over the media and all of a sudden you can see the clarity of the water rather than the litter. Um, so, so really looking at that idea of regenerative and restorative, whilst at the same time, you know, very much appreciating that so many destinations across the world rely on tourism mm. for for. GDP and for, for the survival of the economy. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so if I can uh, remind people uh, uh, who are watching uh, at home or wherever you're watching it, um, you can uh, f uh, fire in questions. We've got a few starting to, to come through. Um, so Amelia, I'm gonna come to you first. So uh, Deborah talked about um, the health inequalities and how that's been illustrated through this, but um, referring back to what uh, Birgitta said about how a lot of people are, are recognizing the benefits of staying at home, the health benefits, social benefits, but there are a lot of people who are unable to do that. Um, and do we think that that's going to exacerbate some of the, the socioeconomic inequalities that we see with bus drivers and cleaners and, and people who've got to physically go to a place of work to do it? And fortunate people like us who can sit at home in our nice offices at home and we're uh, saving money, we're less stressed, uh, and we're uh, being more virtuous because we're not polluting the environment where other people have got to, to carry on going to work. And so are we going to see a, a stretching of, uh, of society and more inequality? That's, that's a great question. I, I think one thing that COVID has demonstrated profoundly is that it has actually deepened pre-COVID inequalities mm. and pre-COVID disparities. And I think on issues exactly like um, skills, um, employment, and training, um, those who have the, the lower skill set at this point, for whatever reason, are going to struggle. I don't think COVID has been kind, um, in a sense, other than to highlight the enormous moral imperative of, of supporting um, folk with whom we cannot do without. There is simply no public sector without them. And clapping and standing you know, on, the, on, on the doorstep uh, <laughs> once a week um, is great, but frankly trite. Um, and I think we need to do a great deal more in terms of supporting them from, from our public policy. I think more importantly, the, the transition um, economically as well, there, there have been massive changes, I think, in what determines uh, stay-at-home business, stay-at-home work. Um, and I think part of the topic I was talking about before, that sort of multifunctionality is trying to break beyond the boundaries of those forms of disparity um, and looking at different, looking at places in a restorative and a regenerative way, rather the way that, that uh, the Caroline was talking about. Um, I guess my, my worry is that some things are destined not to change. Skill sets may be, may be one of them, although we can, I think, transform that naturally with education through universities. Uh, but it's been a little bit desperately sad to see how much politics 
classic politics hasn't changed at all no. in, 19, in, in, in 2020, no. 2021. We're, we're staring a fifth intifada possibly right in the face at this point. Mm. Uh, we've seen more racial tension on this side of the ocean and the other side of the ocean in 2020, 2021 um, than we've seen in the last you know, 20 years combined at a time when you know, we, we, sh we should have been apart from each other. Actually, it's, it's drawn um, inequalities and disparity into incredibly sharp relief, socially, economically, and politically, mm. and uh, it will continue. And Deborah, do you think, I mean, Big Pharma's uh, sort of approach to this has been quite interesting, hasn't it? And we, we've got the, the Oxford AstraZeneca one giving it away for free, others clearly charging, a question as to how much we're charging, how much we're charging different parts of the world. Do you think that um, that the industry can do more to reduce health inequalities? Or do you think it's gone as far? Because clearly these, these vaccines don't come from nowhere. They need a big R&D department to, to make them, uh, to justify the investment to make them happen. So what's your view on, on the ability of the industry to help reduce inequalities? So at the beginning of this, I spoke to a few people in industry and said, are you going to be working on a vaccine? Because that was what you asked them all. And quite a few people um, said, no, vaccines don't make any money. We're not into vaccines. So there's a lot of big pharma yeah. who didn't want to make vaccines because it's not their business, because it's not profitable to big pharma to make vaccines. Um, so the ones that did step up and jump in and, and, and start making the vaccines and you know, put the money towards it. I applaud them for doing that. Mm. Um, I think there are, um, AstraZeneca has very clearly said that uh, during, for during the pandemic, it's not for profit. And, uh, and they're doing the best they can mm. to get as many doses out to wherever they can. And, and I know there's a lot of people in Oxford um, that, uh, you know, they've, they've kind of helped out, and in Public Health England, they've all been helping out with Ebola epidemics, all these mm. kind of things. Mm. So they're very firmly entrenched in the idea that we need to try and make it affordable for everybody. Now, I'm not saying that the other companies don't. I don't know their exact pricing. Um, I very much suspect that they have a sliding scale of prices <laughs> depending on who they're selling it to. I think that's how they're doing I think that's how they're managing it. Um, so, you know, they've, they've taken a lot of risks. I mean, we were uh, really, really fortunate that the, the spike protein, which is the bit on the outside of the virus that you make a reaction to, turned out to be so immunogenic that, you, that all these vaccines worked. I mean, not all of them. There were a few that didn't. Um, it, we were actually, we were all holding our breath and crossing our fingers. We were actually really surprised last November, December at the results right. that were coming out. It was, it was beyond what we'd expected. Everyone had said, if we can get a vaccine that gives 50% protection, that's what we're aiming for. And then all of a sudden, one by one, they all start coming out with you know, 70, 80, 90% protection. So it's been really fortunate. Those companies could have lost a lot of money. <laughs> um, so there was a there was there was a lot of hard work involved, but mm. there was some luck as well. I think. Very good, very good. Um, so, sorry, Richard. Yeah, of course. Isn't that one of those things that's that's just like um, you know we society we we get what what we ask for in a sense. I mean, I, I, I think of it in waste management as well. You know, we got a big problem with plastics and and all of that sort of thing. But you know, we don't actually choose to spend society's money on making sure that sort of stuff doesn't really happen. So. The big pharma issue and whether they engage in doing vaccines or not engage in vaccines, I mean, we have also, as society, has a responsibility yeah, for sending the right signals to big pharma or maybe it's the fossil fuel sector or something like that to say, actually, we don't really want that. Well, we do want you to do something. Please do it. And, and then I think you get a response, but you really need to have that. And, and so much of that traditionally or uh, recently is coming via our consumption, isn't it? That's that's the way that we exactly. put pressure. That's the model of market neoliberalism is, is we put pressure right. through economies. But yes, you're right. That 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 ability to influence where government is investing public money yeah. in, in vaccines, for example, and maybe it is a, a is an illustration, or this is a, a moment where we realise what the public good is comprised of, and we see more of the importance of public good items yeah. like health, Absolutely. like the environment, like nature. And I think then you'll get large corporates and everything responding to that. They'll, they'll, they'll see the signals, hear it, and they will 
I go, okay, we're, we're going to do that now. Mm. Maybe it's antibiotics as well or something. But I go, we'll do this because clearly it's wanted. So I have a question that's come in about um, the impact on, on, on our students. Um, so, Begita, is this uh, psychology always a popular area of subject of study? Is this something, do you think, that more people interested in studying psychology now? I mean, students have been impacted this year. That's sort of fairly well established. But I'm interested in the extent to which this might change what people study uh, in the future. Do you think that that might be the case? That's a very good question. Uh, well, it's not my <laughs> question. It's, uh, I don't know who um, it's from, but thank you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can imagine it will have an impact on people uh, and, and the, the choices they make. Because, of course, I mean, students are concerned of doing something that will give them a job at the end of it. Mm. So they will choose to do things that they will find important uh, and or uh, things that they think are, are going to uh, yeah, there'll be jobs for them at the end of it. So obviously there's been well, sustainability still on the top of the agenda, uh, like mm. Richard was saying. So I think that we have already seen an increase in numbers of people, uh, students are interested in that, even in psychology. Um, but I guess, I, I would guess that there's also going to be a greater interest in, in I don't know, pharmaceuticals and, like, and health, uh, um, those yeah. kinds of areas, but I don't have any figures it's on it. This is just a wild speculation. It's, uh, well, no, that's fine, we're here. We, are, no, I think we can wildly speculate. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at the, the pandemic and the number of news features now that start with experts, scientists, we're going to the University of Oxford, we're going to the University of, you know, and it's it's a complete rejection of the, the Michael Gove, uh, we've had enough of experts, isn't it? Because now everybody on the telly uh, and on the radio is an expert now. And I think it is, it must have elevated the standing of, of universities and scientists and uh, and academics in the view of, the public, I would hope, through this process. Science, yeah. Uh, considering the whole concept of savedness, which is behavioural psychology, yeah, because yeah. you know it's a complex yeah. thing to try. You, you know what you'd like to do, you know what you should do to achieve mm. certain aims, but but knowing whether or not you could do it needs a lot of people with a lot of common sense about how people would behave if you presented things a certain way and how yeah. best. To communicate information to people, so there, there's a, a whole lot of experts on psychology, um, and a lot of experts on maths and you know mm. um, distribution, and uh, it's it's quite a, a huge network of, of scientific advisors that have been involved in. It. I think that's one of the things I like about the the reaction to it. It has been a multidisciplinary mm. approach, and we've needed political responses, we've needed economic solutions, we've needed legal solutions, psychological solutions while we waited for the vaccine to come because the, there's been a there's been six month, nine month lead time before any vaccine emerged. We'd have all been killing ourselves, wouldn't we? Or dropping down dead if there'd been no um, social science, there'd been no behavioral science reaction to this until we just waited for the vaccine and we all twiddled our thumbs. So it's been a, it has been a very multidisciplinary response to the, the, the pandemic. I think it's the psychology to the, to the pedagogy of it, if I may. Um, I, I'm always faced with how long do you wait for something to happen politically uh, mm. in order to have to teach it in the classroom? Um, given that my first two degrees are history, usually it's hundreds of years. <laughs> How long has he or she been dead? Um, well, it's Canadian yeah. history, it's though, Amelia. Oh, so, so oh, that's, uh, <laughs> oh, that's it. No more maple syrup. Yeah, you don't go past, uh, past beef for trapping. We just got electrification. That's right. <laughs> um, I, I, some part of me um, enjoys the, the, the cutting edge, you know, and, and, and the, and the the, the breaking news, and I think students enjoy bringing something very fast-paced into the classroom. Um, and although it's rather bittersweet, I do enjoy, you know, teaching, you know, the, the sort of various shenanigans of Brexit and trying to keep students up to date. Um, oddly enough, the the week that I was going to teach global health last year fell on the first day of lockdown, and I, I had a, a a bit of attention, you know, should I go ahead and try and teach something that's literally unfolding and and furling the 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 world around? And I, I decided to to go ahead and do it. Um, so I had, you know, two happy hours of global health and, um, and multilateralism and, and, and the World Health Organization, et cetera. And I did tell students at the beginning, towards the end, I will attempt to provide reflections, but I'd like you to, to do so as well. The reflections at that point and the year that's passed, having now just taught it a couple of weeks ago, are um, amazing. Mm. They're, they're just like black and white. It's just absolutely fascinating. I also showed my students this year what students last year had said. 
and they, it was utterly unrecognizable. It was, it was very, very doom and gloom last year. We just kept, and, and, and genuine existential angst and panic, mm. real panic. Mm. And now it's, it's, it's a bit more measured. It's, it, there's, a, there's a very entrenched degree um, of pessimism, if I may say. But at the same time, a, a degree of pragmatism and, and a, a clear idea of how to make use of the ways in which they've, 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 they've grown as people, for example. So it's quite a challenge, I think, teaching this as, as educators and being very aware that you're lining young people up, young students, young citizens, young human beings, and trying to help them you know, take advantage and, and make sense of a pandemic or something like, you know, sort of ruptures like uh, like Brexit, so it's tough. So, so yeah. we've got a question come in on that, on, on, on what we think. I mean, we, we, we have this wonderfully privileged position of, of helping to shape young people and what we think the impact of this is going to be on their attitudes and opinions and the way that they see the world. Um, Richard, what do you think with uh, the, 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 the students that, that you teach, just the, their outlook on life as a consequence mm. of the pandemic? I think, if anything, the, the students that, that we teach in, in the centre uh, are actually more motivated to do mm. something strongly positive for sustainability and, and climate change and so on. And, and I think that might, that might be a happy coincidence between the fact that it's still very much on the agenda and there's a lot of movement in this mm. particular area. And there are you know, new careers opening up and being developed and many, many organisations are starting to take this very seriously it's becoming mainstream um, let's say it rather than just a, um, you know um, a sort of peripheral activity i think it's now seen as very central um, so much has been on the news about it and I, as, as well about sustainability with cop coming up mm. um, and so on the, the actions of the climate change committee and the carbon budgets in the uk and so on um, but i think the pandemic has and how we've responded to that in a way has has almost made students want to hang on to their discipline as as one of the um as a sort of rock or a grounding mm. whilst there's this sort of maelstrom going on around and people are having to adapt and get used to it and behave differently that it is something solid it's something that's important and it's something that you can carry through into a future and you know um, you always want every student to, to see a future for themselves. And in some ways, that future is more optimistic, actually, isn't it? Yeah, because of I this think it really is. And, yeah. and, and the, the progress. Yeah, uh -huh. and despite the misery there's been in, in lots of <laughs> things. But a bit of misery makes you more optimistic <laughs> that it's going to get better, I guess. I don't know. But... Yeah, of course. One of the things that I find really quite interesting of course teaching students who are in the kind of the tourism hospitality event sector you can imagine it oh my god the whole sector has basically just stopped um but actually the way in which and come back to the point you made earlier about collaboration and experts of course industry themselves are the experts the way in which we've been able to you know really continue to connect our students with people working in these sectors you know accessing the inspiration of all the, the different approaches that they've taken to continue to build their businesses to, to continue to ensure their viability again it, it just it adds to that sense of you know what there there is optimism that there, there is an end to this where we are seeing things coming out because i think there's also we need to give them space to just kind of go oh, what's what's mm. going on but because that's part of that process of of learning about understanding what the global pandemic means to them and means to their potential futures but but again really ensuring that it's certainly within our within with our programs really continuing that connection with the people who are living and breathing and, and getting those industry connections ensuring that you know like to now you know i'm getting more and more students saying oh you know that's great i've got an interview for my placement or my job or you know so we're seeing that really come back which is just so so wonderful to see yeah. really well, wonderful for sure yeah. um, i think just also add to what everybody's saying one of the things i've noticed with all students is they were more, more and more of them want to do project research, project mm. dissertation projects related to COVID. So to mm. try and understand yeah. why they or themselves, their friends, why, why they're struggling with working at home, why they're struggling with doing Zoom yeah. <laughs> lessons, why they are, why they were enjoying it, engaging with nature, whatever it is. Mm. So, and I think that's potentially really interesting for the for the next generation as well. So they are actively trying to learn from this whole situation and hopefully they'll actually take some of that into the future and and yeah 
help to make more positive change? Well, certainly, I think young mean? people coming through and all the intergenerational equity that's come out of this as an issue of, you know, we've been locked down, we were not really going to get affected by this, we've got to pay for it. Hang on, this is not particularly fair for the future, is it? I mean, all those issues are going to tumble out, I think, aren't they? Yeah, I think that's why I was saying that the quality of education, <laughs> the society that the nursery was, is to find that individual chance for the town. But we have to point at, at the youth of the country who haven't really needed to lock down, but yeah. because they care for the older people around them, yeah. they've, you know, they've, they've gone with it, you know, and it, with good willing as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we have to thank them. Everyone was, everyone has been turning around and going, okay, what can we do to help? What can we do to learn from this and everything? And 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 they have as well, you know, what they could do to help was to mm. was to kind of, you know, put up with all the behavioural change that they had to put up with. I'm sure that when it comes to uh, debating the triple lock in pensions in Parliament in the future, all that will be remembered, <laughs> uh, and the younger generation will so get get rewarded. Uh, uh, maybe not. Canada's looking good now, isn't it? Smile. The question, uh, Deborah, about primary healthcare and the way that that's changed. Well, I'll expand that out towards uh, to be the way that all jobs are sort of going to change in the future and the way that we that we work. So, huge changes, of course, in the way that we access healthcare now, increasingly online, um, getting uh, appointments with GPs over telephone, video call. How much of that stuff do you think will stick for the future? Or are we going to go back to exactly where we were before? Or um, we, we were we were almost getting there before the pandemic. You know, there were uh, I think it's Livy or something where you could uh, get a, a video appointment with a doctor, um, and it accelerated it. Of course, um, it's going to take a while to settle down because there are some people who it doesn't suit and who would like to see a real person, um, and and I think they're in a in hybrid mode a little bit at the moment. Um, but for a lot of people, trying to get a doctor's appointment always used to be really difficult. <laughs> yeah. And then you had to try and clear your diary for mm -hmm. a day. And then, you know, um, whereas it's a lot easier now. There's, you know, it's become a lot more efficient by some of it going online. So I know a lot of people who really like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then there are some people who would just like to, you know, have the reassurance of a, a real life person at the other side of the desk. So I think that, you know, that kind of hybrid thing um, will come about. Um, I don't think it will go back to the way it was before. Um, it, because it was already moving that way anyway. I mean, it's a bit like us with Teams and Zoom, right? We were trying to get people to use Teams and Zoom to talk to each other, and it wasn't really being picked up that much. And then in the, in the space of a week last March, all of a sudden, if you can't use Teams and Zoom, you, you're not doing anything, right? So. Um, so it's just completely accelerated the change on it. It was going that way anyway. And I think yeah. it's just. I will miss the opportunity to catch up on Hello Magazine, though, in the doctor's waiting rooms <laughs> uh, in the future. If, I, if I'm doing an online, uh, so this is where I get my gossip from. Uh, <laughs> it's an image. Uh, Caroline, uh, tourism industry. What do you think? Is that going? How's that going to change for the future? Do you think? Oh gosh, there's so many different caveats and so many different kind of operational aspects to that. I think you know, as I say, and as I said before, I I would like to think we're seeing some really interesting work being done in destinations around. You know, so if you look at places like Hawaii, you look at places like Flanders, you look at, you know, you mentioned before kind of when we were talking like Faroe Islands, etc. And you see some of the fantastic work they've been doing around and taking some really quite significant steps forward, really placing the community in these destinations at the heart of what they're doing. You see places like the Faroe Islands actually taking that step of locking down for a period of time where tourists are not allowed to come mm. to the Faroe Islands because they need to they need to regenerate, they need to re, um, reinvest into the infrastructure. And actually the only people who are allowed to go there are the volunteer tourists who will help them restore the, the environment. So I think that there's a whole range of different things that we could look at there. Um, Again, looking at you know further further down the line, you know maybe people will change their travel behaviours. Many many years ago, we did some research. Gosh, however long that was, um, but looking at people's travel behaviours and their understanding of those impacts, and of course, people are becoming even more aware 
coming back to Richard, what you were saying about the impacts of our travel, whether that's, you know, being aware of a flight and, and the carbon emissions from flights, whether that's being aware of, you know, what, what we're doing within the destinations and the environmental degradation that's happening there. There's lots in the in the in the news, et cetera, around kind of over tourism and the, the impacts that that has. You see places, I mentioned Venice before, you know, just descended with hundreds of thousands of tourists every single year. So I think there will be some significant changes there. There's a big agenda there in terms of, you know, looking at the capacity of destinations, the carrying capacity, and looking at the way in which we can actually manage visitors within destinations. But then, of course, you can kind of go to the the other end of of what we talk about, and it's actually the it's the it's the employment, it's the fairness, it's the the human rights within within this as well. You can you can begin looking at, you know, the the way in which we're using. I mentioned earlier we've been doing some work around virtual travel um, during lockdown. Now, of course, I'm not would not for a moment suggest that we stop travelling and we only go on holiday virtually. I think I would be hounded out, and I would never suggest that anyway. But, but actually, looking and and, and Deborah, you you were making mention of intergenerationality and community. There's there's a real op opportunity to actually harness some of the ways that we are now connecting digitally and, and able to open up virtual travel. There are so many people across this world who cannot travel for whatever reason, whether that's to do with, with health, with mobility, whether it's to do with, you know, just not being able to afford to travel. So what we have learned is that there are so many opportunities to use technologies in ways that actually open up destinations, open up learnings. It's not always about being physically present. Um, so again, you can then combine a kind of an inclusive accessibility agenda with that wider kind of environmental agenda. But you know what, we could go on and on for forever and a day about this, yeah. Um, a slight change of topic, but, but, but uh, on the topic of sustainability, Richard. So there's a question here about um, the, the ability really of government to be able to, to address the climate challenge now, sort of coming out the back of a, of a pandemic, um, COP26 coming up uh, towards the end of the year. So do you think that the government is, is able, is, is this a government that's sort of staggering um, from one thing to the next and therefore diminished ability to now address the climate change agenda? Or actually does this give them the tools and the lessons and the building back better if we actually got a better opportunity to address this now than than we would have done had it not been for the pandemic okay that's a very interesting question whether the pandemic has changed the the sort of um the the ability to act um my view of this is is that government has always been important to set the agenda and everything but the government per se is not really the deliverer of the changes the changes will happen through business, through communities, and through individual actions. So I think if, if government can kind of harness the public mood and, and mm. say, you know, we are going to set policies that go in this direction, we mean them, and they're going to be consistent and, and reliable in the longer term. Uh, and I think we're just about there with it mm. in the UK and in a lot of other countries as well, the European Union, but, but not just in the European Union, but globally. I think the big change in America, for example, mm. USA, uh, with the change of administration and so on. So I, I think um, the Climate Change Committee has said that this decade is the decade of climate action. Yeah. Um, and the action is going to be done, to be honest, not particularly by governments, I don't think. I think it's going to be done by individual businesses, people, things like that. For example, I mean, we, we the university, are, are partnered with a local newspaper to run sustainable business awards in, in Woking for the first time um, that has happened. And we've had a tremendous response. It's attracted a lot of attention. It's a small thing, but it's, it's exactly in that sort of principle of local agenda 21 that was put forward at Rio in 1992. And it's, you know, it's still viable. So these are the actions I think that are really gonna move things. And also undoubtedly big business and insurance companies and so on, financial, uh, you know, f sustainability finance is, is absolutely growing. And people are seeing that as, as the, you know, where we need to be. In fact, if we don't get there, we're, risk is really high. So it is happening. Um, I, I think you've got to take your hat off to government when it set some of this agenda a while back. Yeah. Uh, and great. But 
funnily enough, government has got rather limited sort of levers, I think, uh, yeah, if but, they want to stay as a government, particularly. But, but encouraging, as you say, that some of those ambitions have been set, yeah. uh, at least, uh, and now the challenge of, of meeting those ambitions uh, and persuading all of the world to, to oh. act and to, well, let's just go back to collaboration and cooperation yeah. again, yeah, doesn't absolutely. it? Yeah, absolutely. And incentivization, actually. Yeah. That, that's a massive one. Mm. It's, it's, yeah, that's okay. exactly what governments need to do. In fact, they need to be almost stupidly ambitious. They really mm. need to say, this, this is our ambition, enshrine it in law, really start shoving at the county level, district level, borough level. I could not agree more. That's where that's rolled out and implemented. But strong incentives saying, yeah, no, we're prepared to underwrite and offset the cost of, okay, we can't buy peat yeah. anymore, apparently. Um, so uh, that uh, great uh, start. Excellent. Uh, yeah, well, good, good job. Um, we're going to need hydrogen boilers. We're going to need electric cars. That's fine. But so government is going to need to work, you know, with, with industry, set driving industry, set the tone, show, show those, those incentivizations. Serious. And mm. it's back to psychology again. It's social behavior. It's really pushing. Yeah. and making those norms available and mainstreaming them. Yeah. That perhaps is where the pandemic has been useful because, yeah. you know, the collective behaviour that you <laughs> yeah. were pointing out, Deborah, it was extraordinary. And, and also the scientific collective achievement was, was remarkable. And it's, a, it's really inspiring to say, if we put our minds to stuff like this, it, can, can it gets done. Um, we had that lecture last year, didn't we, Richard, um, from uh, Johan Rockström, yes. who came and, and spoke and talked about the, yep. uh, the sort of the, the generation it took from academics identifying a problem before we actually did something about yeah. it, and it yeah. and it sort of penetrated the public consciousness and the political, the policy concept, and you know we're we've, we're much better at dealing with a problem when the tanks are coming over the hills and we can see here's the common enemy, we know what we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. Climate change is not one yeah, of those problems, is it? And maybe this, we are at that point. I mean, my PhD was almost a generation ago now. It's 25 years ago since I did my PhD on identifying some of these problems. And so maybe we have got to that point where finally action's happening. I think we have. It, it feels very different from the periods in the past when these things blipped up and then yeah. sort of faded and then blipped up energy crises, you, you name it climate change in, in a very different way now yeah. as well isn't it? it's, it's like a different I mean, i'm thinking of veganism i think i love the example of veganism a few uh, 10 20 years ago he talked about oh, veganism right. people are like, oh, you're a weirdo i have nothing to do with you <laughs> And is now, that a psychological analysis? That's, a psycho that's my <laughs> very scientific analysis. Oh, sorry, thank you. I actually use those words in the, in the experiment now. <laughs> um, but yeah, but now it becomes it's becoming much much more mainstream. And I love watching like cooking programs on yeah. television. And uh, the Great British Menu is one of them I really like. And so I, I hope this is not advertising. <laughs> but anyway, there's like there was uh, this the last, last episode. There was a plant based chef in there. That, I mean, this is not something they have to do a, a fish course and a main course, which is meat course. But there was a plant based chef. There was no meat or fish anywhere, and you would not have seen that a few years no. ago. And now it's much more common for people. It's much more easy for people to talk about not eating meat. And this is, like Richard was saying, it's coming from the bottom up. People are doing it. People are, don't want to eat it anymore. And the industry follows. And then slowly... I think we Ooh, might say it was, it's again. endemic now. So yeah. It's not a bad word, is it, from Deborah? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to live with this one, you know. <laughs> um, so um, as, as a last, last few moments... Um, do we think that we're better prepared for a future pandemic or crises of, of some kind? Do you think we've, really we've learned enough from this that, that we would deal with this better next time around? Or are we going to walk <laughs> into the same wall again and, uh, uh, and be surprised it's there? What do you think, Deborah? I think we'll be better prepared for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I will hope that we don't forget yeah, and don't stop forget. because, you know, governments change and time goes passes. I mean, that's one thing that we do certainly need to keep going is the surveillance um, and, you know, catch it before it starts. Mm. There have been quite a few over the last decade or so of mm. near misses, near misses. Mm. in terms of oh. pandemics um, that we've caught because of surveillance. And we just need to keep that surveillance, keep the global communication going um, and make sure that that's funded properly so that that works, so that, you know all the future potential pandemics are just near misses and not one like this. And I guess the opposite risk in some way, isn't it, that the media knows this is a story now. There's huge potential to have us all gathered around the telly in a way that we never did before and, uh, and buying newspapers and the like. 
whether there's a danger that every cough and sneeze now gets reported as oh, there's something going on in uh, uh, in Kent again, and um, and then Kent gets locked down, and we 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 overreact to, to these in the future. I think we've got um, we've got to tread a, uh, an interesting path out of this, um, you know, because we we were prepared to put up with lots of coughs and sneezes mm. and things mm. before. And now mm. we're terrified of them. Mm. And, you know, we can't stay terrified of them forever, but no. we have to be really mindful of the dangers. Mm. And, you know, hopefully with vaccination, it will just take the fangs out of it and, and be a, either an illness you don't even realise you've got or a mild illness mm. um, that doesn't hurt you. And gradually, you know, we can kind of get back to that. But the, uh, people are going to be very wary, mm. you know. Uh, but it was... Going back to what I said before about changing our behaviours, you know, if I absolutely had to come to work, but I had a cold, maybe I would wear a mask. You know, um, the, the number of times when I used to commute in and out of London every day that you'd be sat on a carriage just listening <laughs> yeah. to people yeah. cough over your head all the time. You know, it, it's just I, I've never been more sick than when I was doing that. So, um, so I think, you know, hopefully we will change our behaviours a bit, but not be frightened about them, you know, and learn to live with them. But we do need to be, we do need to remember and be prepared and so stay for the yes, next there was, one. There was no better way of getting sick than a lecture about two to three weeks into the start of term. Wasn't <laughs> yes. it? That, was, uh, that, was, uh, that was the Petri dish of the world, wasn't it? it yeah. was, you could sit there and, uh, yes, feel definitely grubby when you walked out of a lecture theatre after, uh, after that. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I do wonder whether we uh, whether we're more prepared for this uh, for a future pandemic or not. Um... See, I mean, it's interesting how much we know about this virus mm. and the amount of work that's been done on yeah, it. It's and, and it's absolutely astonishing because the astonishing. technology that we've got these days is just amazing. And we didn't have that before. You know, just yeah. this week they found out that in 1918, the flu then they had a variant problem. But of course, they didn't know it at the time. And we know these things now, and we know we can find them out, so we're going to be a, a lot more interested. Do you, do you think there's a danger, though, that we prepare for another flu epidemic? I mean, we, we saw this after the tsunami, uh, and we were super prepared for another tsunami that was happening exactly like the last one. And, <laughs> you know, and there's a danger that we prepare for the last crisis, isn't there? And so is, do you think we might get drawn into that, that risk? I think for a long while people were expecting the next problem would be flu, but it wasn't. It was coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is always that danger. But, but I think the virology, there's enough uh, diversity within virology that, and especially now, you know, especially now when they were all looking at flu and it came from another direction. Yeah. Uh, that I think that's one thing we should learn going forward, that we need to keep this diversity of expertise around um, and keep watching out for all these different things. Excellent. Well, diversity of expertise is uh, is what we've had this evening. So thank you uh, all to everybody for your uh, for your comments. Very much appreciated. Um, apparently, in the YouTube uh, the YouTube description of each show, there is a, a unique feedback link. Um, so if you give your feedback, um, you'll be entered into a prize draw to win a pint, pint of science merchandise. I have no idea what that is <laughs> at all, uh, but I'm sure it's uh, I'm sure it's excellent. Um, uh, bingo winners, we will update you uh, on this at the end of the night. But if I haven't said enough words, uh, science, social distancing, research, healthcare, prevent, quarantine, and vaccine. <laughs> no, but I picked them in a random order. The fellow's not one of them. No. Uh, I didn't get a chance. Oh, no, there we go. Uh, so, with that, uh, <laughs> good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining us and have a safe rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.